Fantastic. Um, pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I am a huge digital optimist at heart, and I think we all have such a big opportunity before us as um, both personally, business-wise, but as, uh, as a nation. We have this opportunity to become a digital nation of some significance. And in order to do that, focusing on our digital DNA, uh, are we going to count the amount of times we, we say that I today? Think so, yeah. yeah. Um, in order to do that, a couple of things have to come together. One is focus on our digital DNA, and I'll go through what I think that means. Um, and something that Rachel talked about, DL local, um, in that it isn't just about London. And, you know, dragging in the corners of the country uh, is really important. And because we are in this digital industry, we have all of the technology available to make that happen and to include the rurally excluded um, and to enable flexible working right across the country. So um, I think that's something very uh, positive that we can do. When I look at um, you know, what it's going to take to meet that skills challenge, I start with the fact that our heritage is very much rooted in computing. Um, you know, if we look at where we've come from, from the invention of the computer right through to the invention of things like graphene, the UK has been right at the forefront of many, many scientific discoveries um, that underpin this digital age. And I think that's really important to remember as we move forward. We have a very big platform that we can leverage. One of the other things that, that astonished me when I looked at the stats was that since 2014, we, the digital industry, in the UK have created 14 unicorns. So that's $14 billion businesses since 2014. Um, and I think that's you know, quite spectacular uh, as a nation. So we are in pretty robust health. And when I look at a survey that we conducted at Tech UK recently, 97% of our members um, said that they were positive about the prospects for growth. Um, but they said that the biggest threat to growth after global economic conditions, of course, is the lack of skilled people coming into the sector and that we will face a digital desert by the year 2020. And that's not very far away. That's about the same time as it's going to take Crossrail to hit London from Maidenhead. So, you know, just think about the concept of that. We have a big lack of skilled people coming into the sector and a big leak of people moving out of the sector. Um, so, you know, this is where we need to be a little bit realistic um, and figure out where these skills are going to come from. Um, and doing what we're doing is just not enough. So whilst we are positive about the potential for growth over the next two years, um, estimates suggest that we might lose something like £2 billion from unfilled roles in the digital sector, which is massive for us. If we are to become a digital nation of significance, how do we, how do we surmount that? And then we will need 2 million skilled workers by 2020 in order to fulfill the UK's digital potential. So what's the problem? One of the problems is clearly the lack of skills relating to the education system for sure. Um, are we equipping our kids to have the skills and tools that they need coming into the world stage in a digital sense? And the answer is probably we're doing some things. Are we doing things that are joined up enough? Um, are we creating a highly skilled, digital savvy workforce um, that we need to create that digital optimism? Um, and I think despite, I think we would all say, despite lots of investment, lots of things that we're all personally doing, the needle doesn't seem to be moving fast enough. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting things is that BBC did a report where it said that 21% of Britain's population um, lack basic digital skills and digital capabilities because they don't have access to the internet. That's pretty shocking. We're all sat here with how many devices? Two, three, four? Yeah. Um, and yet 21% of homes have children in them that 
they can't do their homework because they don't have access to the internet or to a computer. And they, they were considered to be in the not well off category. So I find that quite shocking. Um, and of course they are at a massive disadvantage to our peers, but it does have a knock on effect in our workforce. And I, I just ask you this question, if we were, for example, right here, right now, and Man United might want to think about this, trying to create a football team which you know, can dominate the world stage. We would scout for talent at age eight, four, right? So, and yet we are trying, attempting to fulfill our potential as a digital nation of significance, and we wait for talent to rock up on the doorstep at whenever they finish their, you know, training and whether, you know, they've fallen into technology. So it's a question, you know, where do we start? And I, my submission is we need to also start very, very much younger. Um, the other thing, by the way, that the Football um, League does is it does have a league table of talent and it shines a light on amazingness that happens at the top of that, of that um, football <clears throat> world. And, you know, it is really important that when you have the opportunity to shine a light on digital talent, that we do all participate in that. And that means putting our best people forward for awards and shining a light on those people so that we can emulate what goes on in the football world and say, right, OK, we've got talent here. Look at this, look at this person, look at this role model. And then we can attract people into the industry as well. I was with them. Um, a group of 11 year olds last week giving them uh, girls actually giving awards out at BT Tower for apps that they'd created and a little girl um, showed me her app and she said I said well tell me about your app um, let's call her Emily and she said um, well I'm 11 and before I tell you about my app let me tell you what problem I'm trying to solve I thought wow that's better than digital talent, isn't it? That's so switched on. If my Salesforce even asked that question, I would be totally enthused. Um, but you know, that's where they really get it because that's where apps really come alive because they have a purpose. The why is really clear. And I think sometimes in technology, we do lose our way in creating tech for tech's sake. Um, but these little girls really understood it. And uh, you know, certainly I'll be watching her to see whether I can offer her a job when she's, when she's at the right age. Um, so, what big skills are we looking to create in the next few years? In, the industry is telling us that we will need people who understand the problem, the analysts. We need people who can make it happen, the developers, people who can put it all together, the administrators, and project managers who can execute. And I think those skills are super important. And the tech sector, the digital sector, is telling us that that kind of DNA, that's my number two, um, is really important. Um, but to do that, there is uh, certainly foundational digital skills, so basic computing and STEM skills, um, where everybody can learn specific skills for themselves. Creative application of digital skills as well, because we've got new problems that are needed across the sector, um, and you know we're finding that in areas like wearable technology um, is changing the whole definition of what technology means and what digital can deliver. And then there are specialist digital skills, and that includes the big questions like cyber and big data, all of the things that we need to both accelerate but keep us safe at the same time. So we're not just doing, we're, we're just not doing enough, and, and we, we put a white paper together to just have a look at what we thought we would need to do to put uh, digital skills back on the map. Um, and recommendations that we came up with uh, to support the digital nation of significance. One of them is to demystify technology and digital and inspire young people. And this is where we stop using three-letter acronyms to describe who we are and what we do. Um, you know, I think we are all guilty uh, of being in presentations or delivering uh, presentations with three-letter acronyms which mean nothing to anybody. And, you know, if there's a verb in there, I, I'm delighted usually. Um, but, you know, I think when we're talking to small people at this age, we need to really talk in stories and create really um, good, impactful storytelling opportunities to inspire these children. By the way, these kids are often inspired, as we all were, 
by a, a particular role model who is completely enthused and excited about something. And, you know, I found that I've taken my team into local schools and they've talked about maybe, you know, what they've got out of technology um, through their earning power, or it might be through uh, creative industry, marketing, digital, social media, something like that. And the kids have got really inspired, not by the subject, but by the passion of the person telling the story. So, you know, I think we need to get our heads around how we also tell the story, not just the content, because that definitely inspires the next generation as we move forward. And you'll know that with all the kids and nieces and nephews and what have you that you have at home. They can probably teach you a thing or two about how the new Apple TV works as well, um, which is mystifying our household. Um, so inspiring young people, scaling up digital learning programs as well. So afternoon clubs um, like Apps for Good, if you haven't looked at that, you know, really good at creating games. Um, and inspiring young people. One of these young girls I was talking to last week, she'd created an app to, um, to open up the debate about teenage pregnancies. And she'd created a game, and she said, it's a grim game. It's an 11 year old who shouldn't know about pregnancy at that age in quite this amount of detail. And she said it was a week in the life of a, a young teenage mother. And as you go through the levels of this game, it gets grimmer and grimmer. So you have to go to work, you earn less than, min, live, uh, less than minimum wage because you're a teenager. You have to then ignore your Facebook friends asking you out for, you know, to play in the evening because you've got to look after the baby. Then you've got to go and try and spend this 15 pounds that you've earned to fill a picture of an empty fridge. And it was an amazing app that just, you know, again, gamified quite a striking issue that she's facing in her school years. And I think that's fascinating that they apply those kinds of things. Um, and interestingly enough, I was telling this story to another conference I was at at the IOD the other day, and a gentleman in the audience put his hand up and said he was working with a teenage charity, and could he buy the app? How cool is that? That's just really amazing. Um, I think it's amazing acknowledgement and endorsement for the young kids going into the industry. So, funding early intervention in schools, making teachers aware of resources, because not all teachers are equal in their ability to engage, um, have access to resources and teach, and also improve students' understanding of tech careers as well, because I don't think we sell those particularly well or in an inspiring way. Second one is to have fun, um, and I think making um, digital skills uh, available, but We've, this isn't a typo, so STEAM is, a, is a, an extension of STEM, so putting the arts into STEM and recognise the importance of art as an essential discipline at GCSE so that you get design and gaming into um, the psyche of young kids in tech as well. Um, and of course to tackle the unconscious bias in, uh, uh, from an early age. I think we have huge amounts of role models um, which are male for you know young kids to look up to we don't have that many female role models and you know we can't keep rolling out gray-haired women like me and rachel <laughs> even though you've done amazing things um you know the, the little people don't care about us they want to see cool sort of lisa simpson type role models um and above so let's have more of that um, and use digital tech to empower kids with special needs you know um, I think it's really important. Kids, especially on the autism scale, fabulous on the digital skills agenda. You know, really, really capable. So we should, we should, you know, go large with that. I think. Um, inspire girls to pursue tech subjects. I think that's clear. Let's look at the grim side of that. 17% of women uh, in tech in the UK. Uh, and 23% of London tech firms have no women in senior positions. And it's proven that companies are more profitable and more able to um, deal with market conditions, the markets they're facing into if they have a diverse team. Um, having said that, 52% of gamers are women. So there's your market right there. But they're all designed by blokes. What's going on? Maybe that's a good thing, I don't know. We'll see. Um, 
Uh, 12% of game designers in Britain and 3% of all programmers are women. So very low numbers there. And that's an opportunity for us if we've got this digital desert coming, uh, coming at us. Championing female role models. This is our league table I talked about, you know, emulating what they do in football. Let's put more women up there. Um, and let's have more men inside that debate as well. I'm, I'm very big on bringing a bloke to those women's events because I think it's, you can't have that debate in secret or in a cave. Uh, and um, open days in tech for girls for sure, just show them what it's about and gaining uh, a better understanding of why more girls don't pursue tech. Sometimes it's cultural, uh, you know, families believe that girls should go to certain professions um, and so we, again, we need to tackle that unconscious bias in the family. Um, creating digital skills across all sectors. So this is where uh, young people need digital skills regardless of the occupation they go into because digital is at the heart of every single business that we go into today. There is definitely um, a digital market that we face into and we all expect a consumer-like experience online. Um, wherever we go today. So it's very unusual for us not to have a digital heartbeat. Um, many young people um, may not need, may not know that um, they need to apply for jobs through social media as well. So that's really important for them to grasp that and encourage schools to use digital in non-STEM uh, non subjects. So even when you're researching history subjects or you know, things like that, we will use digital resources. Um, Self-directed learning, I think that's clear. That means we can reach a lot of uh, populations and, and diversity that we wouldn't do before. And then the war on talent in the tech sector is that we really need to create digital skills um, inside every single role across the industry. I think this one um, about schools, we do need some help with that. The computing curriculum from 2014 um, I think we all believe that we need to do more inside that curriculum. It's, we're moving at such a pace. All of your industries are moving so fast that the curriculum can't possibly keep up. Um, and one of the things I'd like to see is um, industry going in to shadow some teachers to help bring the pace of learning back up to where the industry is heading. Um, and, a, and, and an assessment of the new curriculum, I think, needs to be done very, very regularly. Uh, empowering our teachers, this is where we come to shadowing, but also make sure that our teachers have basic qualifications and digital skills themselves, and also create some teacher-supported digital networks where they can strengthen their own skills and keep up, um, not just, you know, the, the kids are for sure coming to school with iPads or technology that's <coughs> much cooler than the ones you get at school, um, and... Um, you're not very tolerant of broadband speeds that you get in schools either. So, you know, I would call on infrastructure changes for schools to be much faster um, in terms of broadband. The apprenticeships are then uh, post-school. I think this is an area where we need to do a lot more, where we as businesses can bring young people into the industry and support, um, you know, SMEs taking apprentices on and encouraging girls um, maybe not call it apprenticeships, because I think that does have a very sort of dungarees and spanner kind of connotation to it. You know, I think internship or, you know, let's make it more girl-friendly. And maybe we can also rename, um, I don't know, engineer as problem solver or something like that. A bit more, you know, accessible in the language that we use and, and how we present it. Um, create new routes to entry. I think industry has to find ways of getting young people in. Does it have to be through the formal route of the milk round and all of that? I think we need to be more practical. How can we get in front of these kids? There are tons of uh, school trusts, tons of um, uh, organizations like the STEMETs, um, or where there's, there's lots of kids and young girls that really want to get into a new career, and this is a really good opportunity, and we should find an opportunity to socialize ourselves with those kinds of, of groups, um, and we can make those available to you. But it's, it's interesting, if you don't have um, a young person program uh, in your team, or you don't, find, you don't do anything to scout for talent, then maybe that's a call to action for just one person in the next year, could you scout for talent, but at a, a, an age younger than you normally would. 
Um, and make it easy, my ninth one is to make it easier for industry to volunteer. I think we could do things like have you know, an app where you know, schools have requirements on the app and we as industry could respond to that. Uh, clearly Microsoft are doing a lot in that area, but you know, maybe we can build an app um, and engage industry to say, come on in, we've got a need here and you know, as long as you're, um, you thought you've got the right skills, then we could maybe make that happen. So an opportunity for us all to, to make a difference there. Volunteering, you, I think we all have volunteering days where we could um, use it to, to um, do more in a digital sense with uh, schools and school children. And then my last one is the one I started with, which is to ensure we reach across the whole of the UK. I think there is a very big focus on London. I think that's great. There's a lot going on in the Northern Powerhouse. That's great. Birmingham is a burgeoning uh, hotspot as well. And certainly Tech UK is working a lot with the Northeast. And I think there's a lot, a lot of positive things happen. And we have to remember it isn't just about cities. There is this concept of technology can enable, enable us to work hard anywhere. And that means we can access talent which can't travel, talent um, which has to work flexible hours because of family or whatever. And I think we need to rethink our cultural DNA in terms of you're only working if I can see you in the office type of culture. Because that could change the problem we have in the tech talent dearth that's going to hit us in 2020. So not just about London, and I applaud the Digital Leaders Local initiative. I think that's really smart and um, going to make a big difference to the country and how we all think together. There's a lot of great things going on in the country, but joining it up in that way is really, really important, and that's what will make the difference. It will create the momentum uh, for change. So I, I suppose um, this one is a little bit contentious as we move into you know, lots of issues with Syria and refugees and I think the argument gets mixed up, but as a nation, we will not be able to grow our talent fast enough to meet the talent requirement that we have as we move forward. And we need to think about smart migration um, into the UK. We need to be able to have um, talent coming in versus talent going out. And international talent is a way of doing that. I think immigration reform is one of the ways we need to think about that for targeted tech talent, um, enable universities to attract top talent as well in a digital sense. And also um, the tech industry has called for consideration, reconsideration of plans regarding tier two visas, which limits the amount of you know, Americans that can come in, for example, into the country. Um, on their visas and we just need to be really clear about our end game. If we are going to create this digital nation of significance then you know, we need to think about all of these things as a whole and not just focus on one thing. So in the, in the uh, small people's area we need to entice them in, make it fun and exciting and give them all the resources to do that but we need to get apprentices in uh, as well so that we're getting some trained kids into the business. We need top talent to come from overseas and we need to get talent back from you know, mothers leaving the industry um, and making it easy for them to come back, but also people who need flexible working. We need them back in the industry as well. With all those things, I think we can probably get there. We just have to have a concerted effort to do that and that means making it um, part of our DNA and I would just leave you on the final piece which is that culture trumps strategy every time and we need to change our cultural DNA with regard to tech talent if we are to become a digital nation of significance. So thank you for listening and I hope we stimulate some conversation for later on. Thank you.